um, situating knowing as a practice of decolonization. And we have a panel here all from the Department of Performativity Studies um, at the University of Krakow in Poland. <clears throat> um, uh, or sorry, at um, Jagiellonian University. I'm probably totally butchered that. Um, and our presenters um, um, are going to be um, uh, Malgorzada Sugiera, um, Matus Chaberski, um, Yua Ball, and Matus um, Borowski. Would you like me to read your each of your bios out? Not necessarily. I'll just uh, okay. take over and I'll okay. just give over to my colleagues. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to my home. I think one of the perks of deterritorialization de is that we visit conference uh, participants at homes. <laughs> um, thanks to Carl and his team for having us, first of all, and then uh, scheduling this session so favorably to us because it's 6 p.m. where we are at the moment. So I hope you are all in time zones that are conducive to intellectual activities. Um, we'll um, take uh, you around 90 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions because it's a, it's a panel so we thought that makes sense to just have q a by the end of all the presentations but we before we go on i would like to on behalf of my colleagues as well um, to say a few words about actually to justify ourselves uh, uh, and to explain what we're actually doing here we weren't sure if we will fit in, but um, but that's why those couple of words. Um, the title of our panel, Situating Knowing uh, as a Practice of Decolonization, has uh, this short intro that we uh, actually uh, decided to, to call um, speculation as method. And um, here's a couple of uh, slides for you. Um, Uh, as you probably recognize from this title, uh, it kind of reveals two major uh, inspirations uh, that stand behind it. On the one hand, it's uh, the concept of situating knowledge making practices, which uh, comes from the seminal paper by Donna Haraway. And uh, on the other hand, it's the agenda of decolonial studies. And uh, our aim um, in connecting all these papers is that we would like to respond to this postulate put forward by Boaventura de Sousa Santos, who in the end of the cognitive empire calls for a profound reevaluation and, and alteration of the ways of producing knowledge that since the scientific revolution in the 17th century has colonized uh, other local ways of knowing, often leading to epistemicides of entire ecologies of knowledge practices. And uh, admittedly, we are not uh, direct addressees of this call in that we cannot claim to represent in any way the global South and its epistemologies, um, but uh, we can neither swear an absolute oath of allegiance to the epistemologies uh, of the North and the Western epistemological traditions. Um, as Roger said, we are all members of the Department of Performativity Studies at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, so you got that perfectly right, pronouncing it. And uh, we therefore belong institutionally to the Polish Academia, and it is within this environment that we have been educated and for the most part conducted research and uh, teaching activities. Um, so in a sense, this geographic and biographic locatedness makes the decolonial agenda particularly appealing to us because of our immersion in a cultural context that can be regarded as a border and the meeting place of various historical and political forces that have been shaping the communities inhabiting this territory in the modern era. Uh, therefore, although not part of the global south, today Poland undoubtedly comes up against its own 
very peculiar and local triple challenge of capitalism, patriarchy, and colonialism that the Sosa Santos has written about. It's particularly today facing a current rise in aggressive nationalism, which couples the most rigid patri patriarchal order uh, with neoliberal exploitation of people and land that the legacy of colonial past of our country needs to be rethought. Uh, it's a country which in the last 400 years not only conducted colonization, but also contributed to the colonizing mission of other countries and also lived its colonial and fortunately unfulfilled dreams. It's also a country that throughout its history was also subject to colonization from neighboring and more distant superpowers. Obviously, we are uh, not uh, going to give you an account of these vast historical, political and epistemological processes. And we restrict ourselves to just probing the possibilities of the conceptual framework of decoloniality to address a few problems which are pertinent to our locally situated scholarly practices. So in a sense, in line with the Sousa Santos call, we look for emerging alternatives to the triple challenge of capitalism patriarchy and colonialism. And it's with this aim in view that we employ the crucial distinction that he introduced um, um, in uh, the book that I already mentioned, um, the uh, distinction between knowing with and knowing about. Uh, countering this paradigm of knowledge understood as disembodied assumedly universally valid items of information, which he calls knowing about, he introduced the concept of knowing with, and knowing with is um, creating connections within local embodied ecologies of knowledges, which do not distinguish between rational cognition and effective impact. Um, however, the specificity of the context in which we work requires a significant proviso. The Sosa Santos clearly juxtaposes the epistemic procedures of the global north and local knowledges rooted in, in indigenous communities of the south, very often relying on media other than writing and therefore spreading in direct live communication. Uh, in the context in which we are situated as scholars investigating mainly various types of cultural performances, we cannot claim to be involved in recuperation of local forms of knowing with typical of indigenous Polish culture if such a phenomenon never existed. The more so that in view of the recent rise in nationalist tendencies, narratives of the strong connection of people and land um, are by no means used as alternatives to the existing order in this context. Um, on the contrary, they are used by representatives of dominant power to support claims of sovereignty on the territory of, that Poland occupies at the same time, excluding from the community all those that are the deemed others. So migrants, ethnic minorities, but also sexual minorities and even left-wing thinkers and politicians, all deemed to be agents of the West aiming to subvert the established traditional order. I wish I was exaggerating, but um, just to answer to Sheldon, Poland is also a story. The same narratives of intrinsic connection with land sanction exploitation of natural environment under the guise of human governance of nature preordained by the Bible. Therefore, cautious of the dangers of these narratives, we turn in a different direction in our search for alternatives. The contributions that you are about to listen to all center around what Donna Haraway terms SF, speculative fabulations understood as sites of possible futures, pasts and presents. And this project of speculative thinking in recent years has been developing as an alternative to the typical modern model of thinking based in fact and refusing to take into account that which is considered impossible by the dominant episteme. So speculative thinking readily embraces the possible without regard for any measures of probability. It's an examination of virtualities present in this situation in order to look for future, um, for future alternatives to the status quo and to find other ways of world making despite the dominant and seemingly objective doxa. 
So in this respect, speculation most commonly found in science fiction and speculative fiction uh, by projecting a possible future or an alternative world enforces a renewed examination of the present, making visible dormant potentials and possibilities. And in this respect, it's opposed to anticipation, uh, the materialization of the probable in the present. So here's a little quote from Juan San Francisco Salazar, who reminds us that speculation comes from the Latin specula, which means a watchtower. So speculation provides, in a sense, a vantage point for grasping alternatives, other possibilities of world making and creating livable communal spaces. And it's this agenda that guided our choice of materials for our presentations, which cover a variety of media formats and conventions, literary and performative forms. And they all offer vantage points on processes of decolonization from the liminal space between global north and south in a culture that was both the colonizer and the colonized. So accordingly, we read them as forms of knowing with, that specific material semiotic experiments, which point to the inseparability of epistemology and materiality. So we offer those readings uh, in the hope of employing speculative fabulations as ways of knowing with, and so intervening and undermining from within the epistemic order of the West. And uh, the first one to uh, give us her paper will be Małgorzata Sugiera, who is head of our department and uh, also uh, researcher in fields such as performativity theories, cultural studies and decoloniality studies. And since you have all received uh, the bios, I will not be giving them uh, in full. So I will just say that her paper is entitled Knowing, Knowing with Writing, Performing Far East from East West. And I hope she's there. Yeah, thank you. I am here. Uh, but I would like to share the screen as well. So yeah, 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 yeah. please yeah. withdraw. Yeah. Okay, I will try it. Is it okay? Yeah, it's work. It works. It's work. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Ah. Oh, okay. Ah. Oh, la 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 la. I just have to. Put a slide of. Film. Mhm. Okay. Now it's fine. Hopefully, yeah. Okay, so um, thank you uh, indeed for this uh, nice introduction and for um, for uh, to all organizers for uh, wanting to have the panel during the conference. And um, I will speak about knowing with writing and about performing is far east from east to west. So you have this nice nice picture from the Japanese art to um, to meet the um, uh, first. Uh, glimpses of uh, Far East. However, it is a paradoxical thing to think about knowing who's writing while writing down my thoughts. The performance of writing in which I am engaging leaves only traces on the flow of thought in uh, conventional science and linguistic structures, revealing an important but usually omitted difference between cause and sign, writing body and written text. It is exactly on this entanglement of knowing and writing that my paper focuses. That is why I'd like to start with a glimpse of Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis, her own utopian story of the first contact. In the first installment of the trilogy, the protagonist named Lilith just awakened and trained to be a human bridge between extraterrestrial oncology and human people starts to learn their foreign language. In order to better remember what she has been taught, Lilith asks for something to write with and on. To keep records outside your own memory has been something obvious for her. 
yet not for Ankali. They prefer to enhance her mental abilities and give her eidetic memory. It seems that while reconstructing errors after a global human war and getting familiar with human cultures, Onkali know better than to fulfill Lilith's wishes. It is even possible that for them, writing belongs to these hierarchical destructive features which Onkali could read in human genes as a foreboding of this species inevitable self-destruction. Writing distances humans from themselves and the world for the sake of experiences their apparent mastery so closely tied to language. Butler does not, not comment on that explicitly. Instead, she imagines uncalled people in contradistinction to humans. The extraterrestrials speak through touch, signals, signs, and multisensory illusions transmitted through head and body tentacles using direct neural stimulation, which most probably inspired James Cameron in his avatar. What is more, and even more pertinent in this context, Onkali have no need to resort to what Bruno Latour calls circulating reference, which helps to abstract and systematize gathered information into, an, into a knowledge system. Thanks to their editing memory, they are able to restore and then transmit embodied embedded knowing in all its local specificity and material concreteness. For humans, there is no other way in xenogenesis, it seems, than to trade genes when oncally and become hybrid constructs, as they are called in the trilogy. And this unique possibility of going beyond our species limitations underlines Butler's speculative fabulation, which imagines the future of humanity. The question I quote, to what extent are contemporary humans a product of writing, unquote, which the Xenogenesis trilogy did not explicitly formulate, has been recently posed by Jacek Dukaj, a Polish SF writer in his volume of essay, Po Piśmie, After Writing, 2019. For Dukaj, Writing is one of basic methods of experience transfer, which he calls mind styles, analogies modeled on lifestyles and used in the English version in the Polish text. Dukaj in the following way explains how writing works at the still dominant technology of knowledge making, I quote. This method has given shape and boosted the whole culture which shapes and gives content to both our life in the material world and our spiritual life. But we are still not aware of the fact that it is exactly writing that determines our reasoning, dreams, choices, instincts, preferences, institutions, and sciences." Unquote. And he also insists that, I quote again, the experience transfer through a language coding has changed humans into subjects of a game of which rules they neither know nor understand, unquote. Therefore, Dukai wonders how to fight a meta level in order to transgress the framework of language of this mind style how to decolonize the writing as in a sense our inborn technology of experience transfer. Duca tried to answer these questions essential for his essayistic reasoning in his most recent novel Imperium Chmur, Cloud's Empire, published 2020. Uh, the novel belongs to the same domain of speculative fabulation as Walter trilogy. However, instead of imagining a possible future, it speculates about an alternative past, looking for other modes of thinking and other possible forms of inheritance. Dukai depicts the Japanese island Hokkaido in the mid Meiji period. A new factory has been built there and a cutting edge weapon reproduced in the high mountains under the cover of clouds. However, 
As you will shortly see, this is only one way of elucidating the novel's title. The new weaponry helped Japan conquer China and Russia, and as a result, become a global empire. Read from this point of view, Imperium Khmur is a typical counterfactual novel in which an invention of a new technology visibly flags a bifurcation point in historical timeline. But the invention is more than just a pretext to speculate on an alternative past of Japan at the turn of 19th century. It, it also clearly refers to a Polish canonical realist novel, Lalka, the Doll, of the late 18, 1880s, read by every secondary school pupil in Poland. It has been translated into almost 30 languages, English and Japanese, among others. In Imperium Chmur, Dukai introduces two fictional characters from, his, from this novel. Its protagonist, Stanisław Wokulski, and a young and poor aristocrat, a would-be scientist and engineer, Julian Ochocki. It is only the latter who, has, uh, who takes an active part in events developing in an alternative Japan. The former, also more important as an intellectual hint, is only spoken about. For none other than Wokulski in the backstory came as an emissary to Japan's emperor Mutsushito with the so-called blessed deal, that it's an offer to trade and secret invention of a metal lighter than air. In the original novel, The Doll, the self-made man Wokulski lives as a wealthy merchant in Warsaw despite his noble background. Making a living on trading is, however, fought off as unworthy of a pole and appropriate only for patronized German and Jews in a stagnate Polish society under Russian governance. By contrast, Dukai depicts Wokulski as an embodiment on transnational industry capital. Not, he not only possesses an estate in East India and the plantation of Java Island, he is also well known as the main constructor of a new city in French Indochina and an author of new policy in Chinese worker district in Singapore. When Japan, already a world empire after the victorious war, compelled European powers to restore independent Poland, most probably in this way fulfilling its part of the previous deal, Wokulski becomes the first president of his native country. Shortly afterwards, he is killed in a coup d'etat, as indeed was a historical Polish president in 1921. The fictional Wokulski, recycled in Dukai's Imperium Chmur, has therefore at least one important function as a literary figure. He clearly indicates a counterfactual mode of this novel. Moreover, its action is set in the Far East, which is manifestly seen from Poland, the conventional Oriental Far East, as, as if defined by Edward Said, which has been set up as a theater stage by the author. It is in this theatrical Japan that Dukai aims to tackle the most important issue introduced in his already mentioned volume of essays, Popishmie. In other words, Instead of simply reversing the binaries of the mind style that still dominates today, he tries to disentangle the master of writing by placing his question in a different context. The Saitian character of Dukai's Oriental Japan is clearly visible in Alexandra, Sukle Alexandra Ukleya's quote unquote, Japanized engravings and pictograms which illustrate the book. Both have a rather aesthetic value for the Polish reader. The engravings and pictograms serve, therefore, as a kind of easy recognizable stage setting in which the novel's event develop on the one hand and the visible sign of their non-realist speculative character on the other. 
the same objective is fulfilled by the Japanese and Chinese words which Dukai left in their original writing in the text without explaining them so as not to slow down the pace of storytelling. The reader may not find their meaning in the glossary edit at the end of the novel. No less important to my argument here is, however, the secret technological invention which Wokulski has traded to Japan's emperor. Wokulski learned about the invention during his visit to Ward Exhibition in Paris. In his hotel, he had been approached by an ex-professor of Sorbonne by the name of Geist, a telling game, a name, I guess, who was looking for financial support for his laboratory tests. Believed by many of his colleagues to be insane, Geist claims to have discovered a new type of organic chemistry, which is, it's, which is in no way, which is in, which in no way has to limit itself to organic compounds that contain carbon in covalent bonding. To prove that he has succeeded in subsidizing carbon by hydrogen, Geist displays three samples of yet unknown metals, one heavier than platinum, one transparent as glass, and one lighter than air. And he insists he does not pursue a utopian project of changing basic laws of nature. He aims rather at broadening our experience of both properties and internal structure of physical bodies. He does it despite his learned colleagues who prefer to see in his metal samples a sensory delusion rather than an essential breach of fundamental law of nature. There is hardly a better example of how the Western system of knowledge dictates what has to be recognized as reality. Also for this reason, Dukai took recourse to Geist's invention in his novel, whose events develop on the theater stage of Meiji, Japan. The author elaborates upon this in a few pages long text entitled, A Cut or How Meaning Occurs, and located in the end of the novel. In the author's note, Dukai explains that he has aimed at creating a haiku in prose. It is true, he clearly admits, that we usually conceive of haiku as a highly climatic poetry, uniquely condensed in a couple of words. Translated into one of Yerwenan languages, it has to consist of no more than three lines, 17 syllables in total. However, these are haikus characteristic only when alphabetic and phonetic languages try to render its poetry into their horizontal notation. Mindful of that, the author reminds us that something else should be understood as essential for haiku, a mind style quite untypical of a Western mind. He summarizes it as a kind of recipe, and I quote, focus on each moment, on the here and now, focus on an unmediated sensual experience. This experience happens in a moment which is shorter than its awareness, and it always reaches us via mediation of sight, sound, smell, and touch." Unquote. As a result, it requires, Dukai continues, that we withdraw our conscious self, refraining from any analytical approach. Thus, the very essence of haiku amounts to a juxtaposition of moment experiences which reveal a new meaning, a new sense which could be expressed in any manner but this, in this juxtaposition typical of haiku. In other words, what it's is at stake here is both an astonishment and revelation which happens between words and images or rather beyond them. Is it still possible, however, to achieve this effect in a historical novel written in a realist style? Dukal provides a kind of instruction how to do it, and I quote again, a cut to a sentence, a cut to its grammar and syntax, 
we cut through these stretchy, vicious tissues, which glue stones of experience together. We cut through cankers of our culture, language, tradition, which obscure a naked experience of our existence in a given moment, our existence in the world, end of quotation. Surprisingly in us, Dukite method brought out the desired result in, in his imperium, Imperium Khmur. It did so despite the novel's linear chronological narration and thanks to unexpected just position of images and events depicted in the present tense to undoing on conventional interplay of effects and causes, fictional characters, actions and their motives, events and their aftermath by moving off and discarding most of their explicative context and context. Unfortunately, I have no enough time to dwell on these haiku features of Dukai's undisciplined novel and will focus on the author's main and daring aim of decolonizing writing as the dominant Western mind style. The very core of the novel consists of the life story of a character named Kyoko, narrated in the present tense. As a daughter of a highly ranked empire official, and who was executed after having rebelled against the main drive of Meiji period to catch up with the West, Kyoko has been forced to live in exile on Hokkaido. There she has learned both how to write with Chinese characters, kanji, and to use short, shorthand writing, the so-called soki. However, in Dukai's Japan, soki has very little to do with a standard scenography stenography, and is never named so in the novel. Possibly, it is for this reason that the word soki is not to be found in the already mentioned glossary. Indeed, Kyoko's soki could hardly be called writing, as she rather uses her fine brush to paint with than to write. She listens and does not even look at what her hand is doing. Her hand, or rather her body, directly leaves traces on the paper without an intermediate the intermediary of a sign system. When asked where did these signs come from, Kyoko sincerely answers, I don't know. Thus, she has no quote unquote knowledge to share and neither she nor somebody else could say was a Kyoko would have painted down the same word in the same way on another day or at another time. In this way, the exiled Koko, uh, Kyoko exiles herself from feeling comfortable at home with the written language. Instead, she turns toward a form of queer dispossession and conceives of different ways of transfer of both experience and knowledge. What is important, when the Polish engineer um, Julian Ochotsky came to build the weaponry factory on Hokkaido, Kyoko has been assigned as his interpreter and secretary. Her main responsibilities involve writing down his business conversations, but also clandestinely tests the results of industrial production of metal lighter than air. Every evening, Kyoko rereads her painted soki in order to write down the meaning in stardant kanji. Then every morning in the presence of Ochotsky, she reads aloud his thoughts and the research results from the day before. Therefore, one has to inquire who has, as a matter of fact, authored the secret technology. I don't know, answered Kyoko. As a result, her failure resembles the one about which Jack Halberstam wrote. It is a failure of a queer refusal of mastery. However, Dukai as a storyteller leaves no doubt as to the consequences of this failure. And I quote, it is not out of white man's dreams that the melodies come to which the metal lighter than air dances, unquote. Ironically enough, Japanese secret service officers every day gather all the pages painted with soki to assemble an archive which manifestly contradicts the very idea of the archive. 
for nobody, even Kyoko herself, can read what has been gathered here. The image of this non-archive is contradicted and at the same time complemented by another image. One day, Kyoko's old cottage go, goes up in flame. The fire frees her thousands of kanji pictograms made of the metal lighter than air. They dance in the air, creating new world, words and new meanings on the nightly sky. Clearly, the, this juxtaposition of two images typical of haiku is another example of the author's gesture of cut, cutting through material entanglement of the writing body and the written meaning. Like Kyoko, Soki, and Stardard Kenji, the two images demonstrate the conventionally omitted difference between cause and sign, which is essential to writing as a technology of experience transfer. In this way, Dukai lays open the mastery tied to writing, which underlines the Western system of knowledge. Admittedly, Butler's xenogenesis overtly engages in a critique of the making and mapping of mankind and its proliferating remnants. However, it does so only to produce new masterful subject of extraterrestrial onkali as an embodiment of life force as such. Contrary to that, Dukai in his novel tries to understand the pervasive mastery intimately ingrained in the fabric of modern thoughts, ways of knowing, and the technology of writing. In so doing, the Polish author carries out the same agenda as Julieta Think in her seminal book, Unthinking Mastery, the Communist and Decolonial Entanglement. Both are, and I quote, to sum up, interested in mastery, not as something to be, to be overcome, but rather as an inheritance that we might yet survived. And thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you. Can you take your presentation yeah. down? Just trying. So, sorry? Trying to do it. Okay. So in the meantime, I'll briefly introduce Mateusz Haberski, who is the latest asset acquired by our department. Um, he um, recently uh, received his, his doctoral degree and uh, his main academic interests are performative performance studies, particularly the kind of connection between affect studies and Anthropocene studies. So this context should be somehow, should somehow uh, explain the title of his presentation, which is Knowing with Stone, Decolonizing Nature from Former West. So give over to you. Are you there? Maybe you're still mute. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, I hope uh, you can see my PowerPoint presentation. You can finally hear me. Um, and I'm also referring, thank you very much for, for, for inviting me and for inviting us again. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also, I'd like to refer to refer back to Sheldon as well uh, before because when when he when when he shared his his family stories and his stories about of families, uh, I thought what a nice coincidence because I'd like to start my 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 presentation with a, with a story as well. In my family, there was a stone larger than a pebble, but still not a cobble. The stone was almost. Pitch, pitch black, smooth and slightly shiny as if made of molten rock. Mm -hmm. when, I when I watched it disintegrate a couple of years ago, too long before I thought about taking a photo of it, if not the stone that you can see, the stone revealed a flaking core of various shades of rust. It clearly stood out from the patchy gran granite boulders, almost omnipresent, 
in the area of Pomorze Zachodnie, part of the former German Hinterpommern region in present day northwestern Poland. You can Google it up or Google map it uh, right now as, as I speak, where I grew up. Uh, the stone was alien to the land, so as my family was when they came to the area after the Second World War from different parts of pre war Poland uh, and elsewhere, lured by the promise of the regained land. The post war communist rhetoric aimed to appropriate former German territories, which only became Poland under the provision of the Potsdam Conference in 1945 for forced and voluntary settlement. Um, my grandfather found the stone probably in the 1970s. He dug it up in one of the sites where he was working at the time as a brigade leader, leader in one of the largest drainage programs in Polish history, which was supposed to turn local arid lands into fertile paradise. Colonizing land uh, naturally went hand in hand with conquering nature. However, the unlikely stone, an odd remainder and reminder of the post-war Polish colonization of nature also enticed imagining in other ways. My grandfather was convinced that the stone was clearly of extraterrestrial provenance and would often speculate about its extraordinary properties yet to be unveiled. He might even per perform experiments on the stone in his makeshift wooden shed in our backyard as he was curious about the stone's use, use in, possible use in his shoemaking side job. But as the stone gestures towards the speculative population where nature is less an inert matter ready for humans to, for, for, for humans to conquer, then a materi materiality replete with potentiality. I use my family story as an advantage or better in this context grounding point to talk about knowing with stone as a way of decolonizing nature from former West. I'm clearly referring here to former West as a term put forward by Maria Slavajova and Simon Sheik as a conceptual challenge to the dominant geopolitical orders in the wake of the political, cultural and economic events of 1989. Unlike Slavajova and Sheikh's work, however, my story does not problematize the post-communist condition of the 1990s. In what follows, I use former West as a pointer to both actual territories, such as Pomorze Zachodnie, which had been part of the West before the uh, Second World War, and practices um, performed in the West, which going against the Western episteme. In this context, Stone seems to be a perfect partner in thought especially at the time of the Anthropocene, the new epoch in Earth's history when yeah. humans have become the dominant geological force on the planet in which, um, and in which the Western epistemic empire predicated on nature-culture divide has tumbled. And you can see that in the plastic which, which now pervades any, all lithic matters and is, is, set to, is, is set to form a, 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 another stratigraphic. Uh, layer in the future, as anthropogenic volcanoes also emerge unexpectedly in desperate parts of the world as a result of intensive oil drilling in mm, stone, hitherto perceived in Western philosophies as the ultimate example of this epistemological stability, becomes imbued with agency. As the term stone also points to existence as different as in size of pebbles, borders, and general lithic materials, it also becomes a, a potential guide into an anthropocenic muddled sense of scale, whereby the boundaries between the local and the global, the recent and deep past, become blurred. Moreover, as critical geographer Catherine Yusuf contends, stone and by extension all lithic materiality reveal deep enmeshment uh, in ongoing post-colonial ways of subjection and resistance. In this context, knowing with stone means standing to political ecologies, kinship, and shared agencies of various modern human collective, collectivities in the Anthropocene. In order to unravel some of the ways of knowing with stone, throughout this paper, I engage or think with a speculative documentary, The Magic Mountain, by Daniel Mann and, I, and, and Eitan Eckhart. The documentary is not, a, it's not speculative in that it imagines distant or utopian futures, it rather performs what Isabel Stengers and Didier de Beers refer to as speculative gestures. I, I point to various situated modes of engagement which make possible worlds percept perceptibly felt in the lived experience. Man and Esbert look for such possibilities in three European lithic landscapes, in Austria, Switzerland, and Poland, uh, around which consecutive parts of the, the, the film are organized. I follow the ways 
uh, of knowing with the geological landscape they would tell in order to scrutinize how they might contribute to creating more sustainable modern human co collectivities uh, across the divide, the West and, and the East divide. Uh, reading the film alongside various uh, new uh, new material uh, theories, I'd like to, I'd be interested in, in three aspects of knowing with stone registered by the film as it posits stone specific forms of agency, foregrounds the speculative ethics of care, and offers ar architectures of access to the archives of the anthropocene. Let me begin, however, by situating uh, knowing with stone within the ongoing project of decolonizing nature. In his work, Decolonizing Nature, a cultural theorist, not historian TJ Demos, argues that the ongoing eco eco crisis and by extension the Anthropocene is first and foremost a political and social crisis implicated in colonial processes which only continue today. Uh, that's uh, what he calls decolonizing nature seems to be seems to be for him the most urgent political project we should engage with. And decolonization in this context means um, means should also should question the nature culture binary uh, associated to Western, uh, Western modes of subjectivity, as well as uh, uh, tackle the underrepresentation of the negative environmental effects on the global south. Uh, Demos notices such decolonization work predominantly in an artistic project, artistic installations, often, often of, the, uh, of the art and science um, denomination. And what's interesting to mention in this context, NAP, uh, example is the work by the Ursula Biman, the, the Swiss artist, uh, the artistic installation Egyptian Chemistry, and in which Biman not only follows interrelations between neg negative ecological consequences of land managing projects in Egypt, local authoritarian politics, and social inequalities, she also fo fo follows various Egyptian and Western philosophies. Uh, which uh, enable to human to theorize non-human agency. However, the, the the decolonizing nature might also be, and this is what I'm interested in here, um, might be performed from within the form the, the context of what I call former West. And in this context, the 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 the, 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 the seminal book by the uh, American ex eco critic uh, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen comes to mind, Stone: An Ecology of the Inhuman, in which uh, in which Cohen engages in uh, uh, in stone as a as a way to uh, theorize ecology routing around the dominant biocentrism of Western critical thought. And he, he allies himself with Elizabeth Povinelli and Catherine Yusuf, the aforementioned Catherine Yusuf in this respect. Uh, what is interesting, however, Cohen turns less to non-Western ways of inhabiting the planet than to pre-modern European practices uh, from before the 16th century and the beginning of the modern slash colonial project. He focuses on practices of late Middle Ages, especially in Britain, registered in extant lapidary texts of epic po and epic poetry from Beowulf to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. As he points out, um, such although such stories are deeply anthropocentric, they, I quote, unleash ecologies in motion uh, that subtly, cha subtly cha challenge the perspective. And the, I think, this explore the, 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 the aforementioned Magic Mountain documentary uh, follows this uh, this assertion of of, of Cohen, uh, but unlike Cohen, um, the Magic Mountain is is mining for for the for the different perspectives and different ways of knowing with stone um, in in Western seemingly Western uh, ways of knowing and ways of engaging with stone which uh, have been overshadowed by Western hegemonic modes of knowing. The Magic Mountain opens with a story of uh, Gastein and Halstorn, a spa in the Austrian Alpine village of Bad Gastein, where patients are invited to shafts renowned for their positive therapeutic effects on the human body. Effort and man's camera follows a patient wearing a bathrobe as he goes into the mountain, literally into the mountain, in a purpose-built train. Gathering archive footage and witnesses, witnesses accounts, the documentary shows that therapeutic agency of stone was discovered as a result of a failed extractivist project. In the 1940s, the Nazi regime 
was digging a new shaft in the area in which in search of mineral ores. And although no precious minerals were found, diggers discovered something peculiar about the rock they explored. The deeper, the deeper they dug, the warmer it got. Meanwhile, the digging also provoked change, changes in the diggers' bodies um, as, as they change. Uh, they were, the diggers were mainly Polish prisoners of war, miners most probably coming from the mining Upper Silesia region, suffering from rheumatism. The longer they worked, the better they felt. Those unusual yet intensive multisensory experiences incited formal scientific research, which only in the 1950s confirmed that radioactive radon ga gas discovered uh, was responsible for the for the for the, for the therapeutic pro uh, uh, properties of the of the shaft. Uh, Man and Eckhart not only tell the story to show both how knowing with stone um, is, is involved with the colonialist extractivist policies, they aim to reflect on the very agency of stone. And in this respect, uh, they refer to what, uh, what the, the British echo critic, uh, Timothy Morton, would describe as rocking. Uh, punningly uh, and, and fittingly so in this context, the term that gathers a whole set of resonances to do with moving in place, oscillation, moving while standing still. That, uh, and you can see a speculative visualization of portions of radioactivity emitted by interacting with rock, in, uh, stone interacting with human bodies on the molecular level as part of the, of the documentary. Uh, that, uh, that's, uh, the, the film I'm, I'm describing also questions this uh, typical theory of action, concept of action as uh, moving uh, as one thing, uh, reacting directly, uh, performing direct effects on others. In this context, rock is rocking, as Morton would have it, uh, as, uh, as a way of queering the uh, passive and active binary. Um, moreover, they, the, the film um, the film problematizes uh, the question of human stone relationality. Whereas part one of the Magic Mountain focuses on bodies of stone, as in the shaft, part two gathers stories of human bodies interacting with stone. The the, the overarching story here uh, comes from a diary of Anton Timaya, um, a, a Swiss. Mm, a Swiss, uh, a Swiss entrepreneur who, as a young boy, was bedridden, uh, suffering from polio. From polio. In 1941, he was consulted by Emma Kuhn. You can see her in the, in the slide. This, a famous, renowned Swiss healer and artist. She circled her pendulum, a small silver chain with a jade ball on one end and silver ball on the other, over the boy's head and said that in order to heal him, she would need a special powder uh, from the boy's village of Rurenlos, where his parents owned quarries. Uh, she visited the area and wandered through the quarry, still circling her pendulum. Once she came to a site close to the ancient, ancient Roman quarry, where her pendulum began um, twirling rapidly. She told the boy's parents to have the stone ground according to specific extracting, cleaning, and pulverizing methods she prescribed. After turning the powder into a paste and applying it to the boy's bandages, um, Anton, Anton Meyer was able to stand up and make a few steps. What's interesting, the powder is still extracted according to Kunz's methods and sold across Switzerland as an element for various types of inflammation. Um, and, and it's still named uh, A on A, a name chose by Kunz herself, uh, referring to the Greek word meaning without limitation, as the stone powder was supposed to uh, uh, heal, uh, heal without limitation. And that's the story of uh, Anton Maia and Emma Kunz clearly demonstrate that knowing with stone uh, is deeply enmeshed with a particular ethics of care. And in this context, I'm referring to, uh, to Maria Puy de la, de, la Casa, de, la, de la Casa term, matters of care. Those are knowledge-making knowledge practices which aim at finding ways to re-affect an objectified world, and quote, unquote. The objectified world here means the effects of Western knowledge-making practices, 
and reaffecting its sentiment to the need to restore the effective potential of scientific research in order to expose the performances of non-humans that we need to care for. Thus, in this context, in the La Bella Casa's approach, uh, care is not merely about tending to a patient, as in Emma Kunz's case, or an unspecified feeling of anxiety caused by a difficult situation. De La Bella Casa adopts a feminist materialist conception of care as a practice of intimate engaging with the world in maintaining and repair, in order to maintain and repair our world so that we live in it as well as possible. And this aspect uh, of matters of care is, uh, is evident, is made evident uh, by man and effort. Interview with a stone cutter walking at the, one of the quarries uh, in, in, owned by the former uh, Maya family. Uh, he not only insists that his work requires careful attention to ecological consequences, he says, at one point, he says that when he works with stone, there is a direct, there is a connection between his head, the middle of his forehead, and the, the stone he's cutting. So matters of care also uh, undermine this, uh, this binary between human and uh, inorganic matter in this context. Um, However, the, the Magic Mountain, and this is my last example in the last story uh, told by the Magic Mountain, tells a story, shows that this uh, effective relationship between humans and, uh, not, and, and lithic materiality um, travels across time. In the first part of the, of the film, um, Man and Ephra take, take, take us from Switzerland, closer to where I began my paper, to a little village of Ludwikowice, former Ludwigsdorf, in the Owl Mountains in southwestern Poland. The third part of the film tells the story of a former Nazi complex of unfinished underground bunkers and shafts built between 1943 and 45, now turned into a museum and memorial site. Man and Efrat explored the site through a series of interviews with guides, scavengers, and treasure hunters who from time to time hid the news claiming to have found the Amber Room. Tellingly, however, this part of the film uh, starts from uh, over, starts over, begins overground with a long shot of the forest growing in the area. An interviewee talks about the trees as silent witnesses of the past and shares uh, his way through paying attention to 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 the materiality of the trees. That magic mountain and uh, with an invitation to think about stone as an archive, uh, and and in this vein, the, the the documentary aligns itself with the with the recent work in the across the post humanities and earth sciences, uh, which revisit the concept of archives of nature put forward in 1778 by the French naturalist Georges Louis Leclerc. Whereas Leclerc's thing was to read natural phenomena as traces of Earth's glorious past, contemporary scholars turn to trees, eyes, and other non-humans, critically, as reminders and remainders of ecological, political, and social catastrophes. From this perspective, we can read uh, the work by the, one of the proponents of the Anthropocene, a geologist, Jan Zalasiewicz, who in his work, The Planet in a Pebble, a journey into Earth's deep history, uh, closely inspects the pebble he found on the west shore, on the shore of, of Wales in Britain, in order to show how it tells the story of volcanic eruptions, life and death of extinct animals and plants, as well as uh, the the eco catastrophe we're facing today. Due to Zalashevich's traditional scientific training, however, he still upholds the nature culture binary as he reads uh, and pretends to read different parameters. Uh, so quote unquote objective parameters of stone as uh, direct pointers to the states of uh, to the past events, catastrophic past events. In this context, the uh, Magic Mountain offers a more effective architecture of access to the past and uh, to stone as an archive, which materializes here. Sorry for the for the quality of this screenshot, but uh, this those are pearls coming from one of the closing images of the film. And the pearls, uh, the pearls, however, are not the organic, inorganic composite material produced by some mollusks as an inner shell layer that we know. They are made of calcite and limestone, which came from the cement 
carried by the prisoners of the nearby Gross Rosen concentration camp. As the guide concludes, the pearls are made of sweat and blood of those who died uh, somewhere overground, somewhere else above the, this shaft, um, and thus who died there from murderous work, and as such should be respected. Thus the story of Pearls clearly shows that knowing with stone archives of the Anthropocene not only point to anthropogenic catastrophes, but also carries and should carry uh, effective materiality of suffering of particular human population. Uh, thank you. That's, that's, that's it for, for, for this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Please take your presentation down. And as you are doing it, I would like to call uh, out my other colleague, Eva Wall, who is uh, also a professor at Howard Department. And uh, her main uh, academic interests are cultural mobility of performance and theater in the first place, but also minority language theater and performance, uh, particularly within the um, decolonial and post-colonial studies. And uh, Eva will be speaking about knowing with natural cultural ruins of Eastern Europe. And I hope she's there. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, uh, Mateusz? Yeah. It's all right? You can, yeah. you, you can hear me well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for having, well, for, for uh, having the possibility of, of uh, participating to this conference. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I will uh, start my presentation by explaining the title. Let me just share my screen and um, just tell me if you can see it well um this is it's all right can you uh, see it right. yes right. okay mm -hmm. so um i would like to begin my presentation by explaining the title what i mean by the natural cultural ruins of eastern europe well the term can be understood in various ways as a remnant of the geopolitical Cold War division of the world into East and West, or as Russian decolonial scholar Madina Tlostanova puts it, as a part of Eastern Europe, which despite the collapse of the Soviet Union has not managed to reach the Western European conception of history. And here I quote, uh, the suddenly revoked socialist modernity left its voluntary and involuntary participants and agents in ruins unable to rejoin history, end quote. I must say I find Lestanova's concept rather problematic as she continues to identify the West with civilizational progress and the East with historical and civilizational backwardness. This is especially true if ruins and knowing with ruins is to become the basis for decolonial thinking and thus... Would you... Okay, thank you. May I continue? So... Um, especially uh, um, true if ruins and knowing with ruins is to become the basis for decolonial thinking and thus the basis for a critical examination of the onto-epistemological division between Eastern and Western Europe shaped back in the Enlightenment. As such, my argument would be better served by the concept of ruins proposed by Anne Lovenhout Singh in her well-known The Mushroom at the End of the World a book written in response to catastrophic post anthropocentric visions of world destruction. For seeing ruins uh, is to say spaces or territories created through uh, anthropogenic environmental changes and exploitative and civilizational progress oriented practices can be a field where new ecosystems or alliances between human and non-human subjects emerge and these give us hope 
for finding new cognitive models and knowledge making practices. Quote, world making projects emerge from the practical activities of making lives and in the process, these projects alter our planet. Many pre-industrial livelihoods exist today and new ones emerge, but we neglect them as they are not part of progress. These livelihoods make worlds too, and they show us how to look around rather than ahead. To my mind, an example of such productive ruins is the mountainous territory of southeastern Poland, where the border between uh, Ukraine and Poland was established after uh, 1945, and which has also been a geopolitical eastern border of the European Union. And I'm talking about this little territory over there. Uh, well, a completely arbitrary border, I might say, because as I intend to prove, what is happening on this border and the ruined territory at the same time contradicts the dualistic and pre-statutory divisions that mark Western epistemics and allows us to decolonize our knowledge concerning the supposed discrepancy between the East and the West of Europe. Uh, before the Second World War, the area of Bieszczady mountains, the foothills of the Carpathian mountains, are, were inhabited by the indi indigenous Boikos, Carpathian Highlanders, neighboring the Hutsuls here to the east and Le Lamkos to the west. Most of them were Orthodox or Greco-Catholic and spoke languages that are now considered dialects of Ukrainian. Before the Second World War, all the territories they inhabited were incorporated into the Polish state, which has different borders. However, after the Second World War, as a result of the new Polish borders defined by a Yalta conference and they shift to the West, both Poland and Ukrainian Soviet Republic undertook mass resettlements and um, involving several million people in an attempt to build supposedly homogeneous and nationally unified states. Millions of Poles excuse me, millions of Poles, including my grandparents and parents, had to leave their homes in what is now Ukraine and move to what has had been German territory, while the Carpathian Highlanders, Boikos and Wemkos, were partly resettled to what is now Ukraine and deep into Poland. The aim of these resettlements was to deliberately sever links between indigenous inhabitants and their territory, their language, their religion, and their local ecosystem. The houses and farms were almost completely destroyed. The few remaining Orthodox churches were turned into Catholic churches, and the houses and farm buildings were mostly burned down or, or looted. In turn, what survived was relocated tens of kilometers to various open air museums in both the Polish and Ukrainian side of the border. This ethnic cleansing had two major consequences. First of all, during the second half of the 20th century, the lands abandoned by Carpathian Highlanders, and here you have some photos before the Second World War, were swallowed up by nature, which came to produce an image of wilderness and touched by human hand, reawaking Polish colonial fantasies of the conquest of the Far East, especially reinforced by the pop culture or Polish HBO television series, The Border, uh, from 2014 to 2020. 
In that series, which is only an example of a broader trend, both in literature and popular culture, the mountainous areas of the Bieszczady region are presented in brave taking panoramas where wolves, bears and deer roam free, undisturbed by human presence. If a man appears in this landscape, he usually shirks the comforts of civilization and to survive, he must have special skills and abilities. The protagonist of the series is a Polish border guard, a good sheriff, Redbrov, who follows the smuggling routes linking east and west and who sometimes manages to rescue innocent children and women from human traffickers from the east. Watching the series, it seems if no one ever lived in these mountainous areas, and as if the green belt dividing Poland and Ukraine was a crucial safety valve against the dangers flowing in from the east. Organized crime, prostitution and arms trafficking. The racist overtones of this series were much discussed, which is why it did not receive wide distribution in Europe. In Poland, however, it revived nostalgia for extreme experiences in contact with supposedly unspoiled nature, while the Bieszczady border guard forest hideouts left over from the film set became tourist attractions. If one were to stop only at pop culture performances, one might get the impression that the traces of the former Boyko community are irre irrelevant today to today's viewers and tourists and are hardly noticeable. Yet paradoxically, they have been exposed in a very specific way. The material remnants of Carpathian Highlanders have been torn from the original context and ecosystem, fragmented and then reassembled in the anachronistic and bodrial dran simulacrum of the uh, Carpathian village. Except that uh, these buildings, deprived of their former inhabitants, have become a kind of ethnographic amusement park, uh, where after paying for a ticket, you can feel what a life in this area was supposedly like before 1945. The problem is, However, that instead of retrieving the old culture for the present, these parks produce just the opposite effect. As the guides of the Open Air Museum emphasize at every step, Boyko culture was a primitive community, which at the time when houses in Western Europe already had electricity, running water and central heating, was still living in wooden huts with clay floors, no running water, and no light. It is therefore a model example of a mechanism whereby an indigenous culture is reduced to its material remains, suitably fragmented and detached from everyday use, and as ethnos is relegated to an anachronistic past, or as Johannes Fabian has said, the coevalness of time between the cognitive subject and the object has been broken. So the ethnic community has become a mute, silenced object deprived of epistemic power. The question then is what can be done to oppose the discourse of exploitative politics and civilizational progress and colonial conquest and how to take the ruins of this world abandoned by indigenous people and rebuilt the epistemic power of those agents and subjects who have created new ecosystems of collaboration. I found an answer to this question in a theater production by Polish director Katarzyna Szyngiera, who has spent years exploring the current and historical relations between Poland and Ukraine as symbolic embodiments of the West and the East, while attempting to undermine these onto-epistemic divisions. In her latest production, The Border, while the connection with the HBO series is not accident, Shingera plays, uh, plays it in part as uh, satire, 
she takes a critical look at what is happening on this mountainous forested border between Poland and Ukraine at a time when the COVID pandemic closed the European um, uh, countries borders in March to, uh, 2020, last year. Um, as a first response, the epidemic, as everyone has probably noticed all over the world, revived nationalist and racist discourses of cultural homogeneity and purity. The Polish and Ukrainian authorities left their citizens a short window of time to let them return to their national territories, after which they ordered the closure of the borders for fear of contamination, literally by the disease, but metaphorically by foreigners. However, as Shingera performance clearly shows, contamination cannot be stopped even when the borders are closed. First of all, the virus has democratically spread regardless of the erected walls between East and West Europe and continues to do so. Secondly, in border areas, entire ecosystem of specialized trafficking agents of organized smuggling of people and goods had already emerged in the 30 years after the collapse of Soviet Union, Soviet Russia. And this did not stop when the pandemic closed the borders. As Lovenhaupt Singh said, on the ruins of exploited land, new ecosystems and models of cooperation emerge to oppose the geopolitical dualistic epistemic divisions between West and East. Yet, this is not the, the uh, only role. In fact, they envision the future, the ways in which territorial ruins of former indigenous land can provide a chance for such new models of collaboration as contamination between human and non-human objects or subjects, or excuse me, non-human subjects as, or subjects considered less human, providing a chance to decolonize our knowledge. In her performance, Shingera includes, Shingera includes a mockumentary film in which she shows, among other things, how Polish customs officers in the Bieszczady Mountains take advantage of the existing economic and political inequalities between Poles and new arrivals from the East, collecting illegal fees from smugglers and, in a way, becoming smugglers themselves accustomed to the fact that almost every pers person crossing the border is a potential refugee, economic migrant, they assume that Ukrainian citizens may in fact be someone else coming from the even more distant Eastern territories of Europe and Asia. One of the key moments um, of the documentary is when a mysterious woman the woman without an identity enters the border guard booth. Being transported illegally, she's carrying a fake Ukrainian passport. The customs officer asks her for her real nationality and name. The woman does not answer any of this question. She only repeats her assumed Ukrainian name and date of birth, birth in broken in English. She also refuses to take a Ukrainian language test when the customs officer asks her to read a Ukrainian paper, newspaper. There is virtually nothing in her appearance, in my opinion, to indicate her origin, making it difficult for the customs officers to apply racial prejudices or to speculate about where she might be from. The woman herself does not know where she is as the name Poland means little to her, and she cannot place Poland on the map of Europe. The customs officers, and with them the audience, are thus helpless, unsure of the woman's real identity, unable to obtain any identifying information from her. They face their own cognitive helplessness. Thus the figure of the refugee calls the whole 
Western epistem into question in the sense that it confronts us with something that is unknown and that eludes our existing cognitive categories. The actress playing the mute refugee in the documentary film screened during the performance appears on the real stage after a while, faces the audience as if the, as if the cognitive impulse in mockumentary has been transferred to a real face-to-face -face meeting. Standing in front of the audience, she recites a litany to the accompaniment of grating music consisting of stereotypical terms often attributed to refugees. She is a prostitute, she is an ecstasy pill, she is a presidential candidate of warring state, a victim of traffickers, a girl for sale. After a while, however, her words become hard to make out and the timbre of her voice so squeaky and unpleasant to hear as to be almost unbearable. This scene is crucial to me in terms of the problem I am addressing, that is my search for examples of the creative contamination or breakdown of the cognitive empire of the Western epistem on the ruins of the old war as we know, world as we know it. It shows ways out of the impasse and opens up possibilities for the decolonization of knowledge. By appearing on stage, the woman without identity restores, uh, on the one hand, the lost coevalness of time between the knower and the known subject. It means the simultaneity of the encounter between two different and mutually incomprehensible subjects, thus preventing the discriminator from putting her back in time. Secondly, by refusing to take an identity defined and recognized by the Western epistem, she simultaneously resists those mechanisms of the colonial gaze that structure the world according to the well-known categories. As Elizabeth Povenelli has written, in a world dominated by demos and logos and the commons proper to them, Things are difficult for subjects who elude the prevailing cognitive categories, but it is precisely their otherness, novelty, incomprehensibility, or even in the case of the woman without an identity, cognitive resistance, that a chance to decolonize our system of cognition emerges. For it forces us to suspend and take a critical look at the conceptual system to which we have been accustomed. In this context, knowing with natural cultural ruins of Eastern Europe means unlearning what we already know and opening up our horizons to the unknown. Thank you very much. Thank you. We already have uh, um, some interventions. Uh, I can't, excuse me, I can't uh, put back. Na górze, my... masz, na górze masz takie coś, view options. I tam... A stop share, okay. Tak. Thank um, we already have uh, some interventions on our chat, so we'll, um, I think, come back to it in the Q&As. And uh, now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing myself. I don't know why I agreed to this, but uh, I, I have to read from paper, actually. Uh, I also belong to the de performance um, performativity department and uh, recently I've been dealing mostly with um, um, speculative and uh, uh, counterfactual narratives in historiography and on the intersection of arts and sciences. So actually I cannot really justify um, my title in that context. Uh, which is knowing with the city. And um, I would like to start from something quite obvious, um, namely the fact that um, it's at least from 1974 when Henri Lefebvre published this production of space that space came to be considered as a complex social construction which affects social practices and perception. And uh, Lefebvre worked on the assumption that processes of modernization 
led, among others, to an intense urbanization of social life uh, that is shaping of social relations through design of the city. And he used this concept within a larger framework to speak um, about processes um, of colonization of everyday life by the capitalist logic of market, which organizes urban environments, spaces of consumption and market exchanges, threatening other types of social bonds. This perspective clearly entails that uh, the mechanisms of production of urban space also provide access to the underlying processes of colonization of space and at the same time offer insights into ways of countering it. And uh, this access, in other words, um, is a way of knowing these mechanisms, but it requires an introduction of a vantage point that defamiliarizes the daily experience of urban life. And um, in the following, I would like to take a look at how this particular theme is taken up in speculative fiction or speculative fabulations in the more recent context of the socio-political changes in post-communist states transitioning into neoliberal capitalist order. And um, I'll do it by way of an example of such a speculative fiction, namely China Maevil's novel, uh, The City and the City, uh, which as um, Maevil commented in an interview uh, which followed this publication was uh, about the notion of the city. And here you have a quote as a text of clues in a kind of constant equilibrium, a constant quantum oscillation between possibilities, with the moment of the solution really being a collapse and, in a sense, a kind of tragedy, unquote. It's actually not by accident that he, that he refers to the vocabulary of quantum physics, which seems to have influenced the basic spatial concept of the autonomous cities in which the novel is set, because the plot is pretty conventional and uh, it draws on uh, the stock of uh, tropes of crime fiction uh, in that uh, the principal action is about an investigation into a murder of a young American woman who is a student of archaeology in an East European city who, uh, as it turns out, uh, and this is a spoiler, uh, dies because she discovered a conspiracy of an American corporate executive who extracts precious ancient artifacts from the archaeological site where she works. So um, you can say uh, that uh, the murder investigation that unveils a conspiracy run by a representative of a capitalist corporation is pretty conventional in crime fiction, at least from uh, John Buchan's 39 Steps from 1915. Um, but in uh, Maevel's novel, this trope is uh, in a sense updated through a very ingenious narrative device because the action of the novel is set in fictional twin states, state cities, Beshel and Alcoma, which in a version of quantum theory occupy the same theory, um, territory. And uh, citizens of both these states uh, share the same space, but they do not see each other because uh, they live in clearly demarcated autonomous realities and uh, they are forced by law to carry out on daily basis a cognitive performance of what's called unseeing the people the buildings the objects belonging to the other city so um, an omnipresent secret police section called breach immediately identifies these acts of disobedience and punishes them more severely than murder so in a sense this geopolitical peculiarity functions as an obstacle on the way to solving the murder mystery which, as we find out in the beginning, involves different individuals and organizations from both states. And uh, what's significant, although the exact location of these two cities is not given in the novel, there are clear indications that we are in a kind of an alternative reality somewhere in Eastern Europe within the former Soviet bloc. And uh, what testifies to this is not only the proximity of other European cities, uh, mentioned in the novel, but also um, the fact that uh, the action takes place in the first decade of the 21st century. So what's more important, uh, at numerous junctures in the novel, um, um, it's indicated that we are in a geopolitical milieu that uh, uh, where multinational capital is slowly making its way. And the characters mentioned the fact that members of the state administration have recently started to get involved in commercial matters, 
attend business meetings with representatives of foreign capital. Also, um, aggressive national propaganda is suggested to be the work of newspapers controlled by British or American owners. And even the cityscape uh, tells you this story because you have wooden rooftops which are slowly ousted by um, mirrored steel. So um, this kind of seems to reflect the very slow encroachment of capital, which is quite typical of post-communist states. And um, Carl Friedman, a science fiction um, a scholar uh, commenting, commenting on this novel, um, somehow um, analyzes as a juxtaposition of two orders of organizing reality, social reality, because this policing of borders, which is implemented by the two cities, is a typical imperial operation of the nation state, which in this way sets out to strengthen its, its sovereignty on a given territory occupied by a population understood as a national collective. And uh, as Friedman argues, um, uh, actually he draws on um, seminal work by Hart and Negri from 2000 that uh, this historical descendant of the colonial powers of the 19th century, namely imperialism, is currently superseded by a different form of power. And he reads this novel as a story of this um, uh, succession of two orders of uh, rule. And Hart um, um, and Negri argued that this old rule of nation, na nation states has by the end of the 20th century been replaced by a globalized rule of accumulated capital and this new type of sovereignty, which they call empire with capital E, is a decentered and deterritorializing apparatus of rule, which is unmoored from any nation state and it operates beyond any borders and manages hybrid identities, flexible hierarchies and plural exchanges through modulating net networks of command. And I think Friedman is right when he says that this novel, um, in a sense, um, um, is about this process. Uh, but uh, he clearly points to the fact that uh, this uh, novel de demonstrates that nationalist agenda in post-communist states is just a smokescreen for the implementation of the rule of empire as a new type of deterritorialized sovereignty. Um, and this, there's just one thing that I'm not really convinced about in his argument, namely when he calls this novel an illustration of these processes and an arealistic political satire. Because uh, I think that by employing this conceptual apparatus of uh, literary studies, he somehow fails to account for the effective impact of that novel, which not so much illustrates geopolitical processes, um, so he doesn't really make the readers know about them, but rather provides a framework for knowing with the city and uh, making the readers see how a spatial urban setup governs perceptual processes and performatively creates social reality. Um, in this novel, as I said, the conventional crime plot is just a pretext for exploring the workings of nation state in the perceptual patterns that are imposed by the urban space. So the novel, uh, which is written in first person from the point of view of Inspector Borlu, who is investigating the whole crime, imposes this perspective on the reader and makes salient this obligatory act of unseeing, um, that is of state-sanctioned ignorance, in a sense. And in uh, this respect, the novel differs from uh, conventional crime fiction, in which part of the readerly experience lies in the search and interpretation of clues together with the detective. So if you remember um, Agatha Christie's novels, uh, she wrote them in such a way that the reader could follow the detective and in a sense control the procedures that uh, the detective employed to solve the mystery. And also uh, the reader could see whether they find uh, the clues and properly um, interpret them. But in the city and the city, the search is um, in a sense manifestly thwarted because um, uh, Maeville directs the reader's attention to what is and should remain unseen. And the unseen is the most important element that we should actually notice so to see what cannot be, unseen, uh, cannot be seen. So what used to be frustrating for the readers of Agatha Christie's stories as detectives' mistakes, here brings to the foreground the structure of the city and the crucial feature of the nation state ideology, namely that borders between the states 
have a purely imaginary existence and they are a performative effect of interaction with urban space. So such a reading um, clearly opposed the concept of a novel as an illustration of social processes and in its place offers an account of fiction as a form of active knowing. And this account um, also undermines the division between academically sanctioned scholarly disciplines and literary fiction uh, distinction, which I think is fundamental for the cognitive Western cognitive empire. So I'm trying to convince you that uh, um, this uh, change is, uh, in a sense, critical for undermining the Western cognitive uh, empire. And also, uh, I'm guided by uh, the recent studies in crime fiction, which demonstrate that it has had crucial cognitive function and also a subversive potential. So to quote such a study, which was quite significant for me, was uh, is Luke Boltanski's Mysteries and, and Conspiracies from 2012. The English version was published two years later. And uh, as he says, it's not by accident that crime fiction came into being in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, together with the modern nation states, to which we owe the project of constructing reality for a given population on a given territory. And uh, as Boltanski argues, detective novels focus on a crime as an anomaly and a rift in a fabric of this constructed and held, upheld reality of the nation state. So on the one hand, they demonstrate the process of restoring order, which is very often threatened by all that try to evade the territorializing logic of nation state. And this agent is usually personified in the figure of a corrupt aristocrat turned capitalist or a banker who is typically a Jew, an internal enemy. However, as Boltanski says, there is a, a flip side to that because, and here you have uh, this quote, crime novels and spy stories have arguably been the chief means of exposing to a broad, broad public certain concerns that precisely because they go to the heart of political arrangements and call into question the very contours of modernity could not easily have been approached head on outside of limited circles. So what I like about this approach, it shows a sort of double face of popular culture as well. And in this respect, crime novel um, as a way of knowing social reality outside of academic sociology is, uh, as Boltanski says, a trial or a test for the state as the agency constructing reality, a test that could potentially undermine the belief in the homogeneous fabric of reality, which thus weakens the authority of the state. So in the case of uh, my example, the city and the city, this test is conducted on the level of perceptual processes and this speculative element brings to the foreground a structural element that typically provided background for urban detective stories. That is um, a crucial connection with the changes of cities in the modern era. And here I, uh, I'm guided by Frederick Jameson's uh, recent uh, short book about Raymond Chandler's prose, um, because Jameson uh, says that an integral element of the investigations carried out, carried out by Philip Marlowe is the urban development of Los Angeles in the 1940s and 50s, which actually reflected the imperial politics of pushing the culturally and ethnically others, primarily Mexicans, outside of the city borders, um, condemning them to social invisibility, in a sense. And um, here is a short quote from Jameson, because uh, his approach is also, um, in a sense, similar to what I would like to show, is that Chandler's prose is um, full of more or less overt references to Mexico uh, as an uh, initial mechanism for sensitizing the reader to what lies beyond the frame, to categories of an essentially spatial otherness of which Mexico proper is only uh, the strongest form. And that's why he reads uh, Chandler's novels as a phenomenological training uh, in which we learn to sense distance, separation, disjunction between a container and its contents. So again, in a sense, prose as, a, as an active doing and active knowing. So uh, from this point of view, crime fiction as a means of phenomenological training that teaches the reader to see what could otherwise pass unnoticed 
in the urban space points to the potential of this form of popular culture to become a form of decolonization of perception of the space by sensitizing the reader to you know, those who otherwise remain invisible. And uh, it's on this potential of crime fiction that I think Maidel capitalizes on by putting the problem of perception of urban space in the center of his novel. And um, he draws a clear parallel between these processes of perception with the processes of colonization by setting the novel in the context of the geopolitical changes in the wake of the fall of the communism. So I read um, this novel as a um, form of a speculative fabulation in this sense in which Mark Rifkin um, defines speculation in a great book, Fictions of Land and Flesh, uh, in which he analyzes um, a selection of science fiction novels written by indigenous American and black writers and fo focuses on the way in which uh, speculative fiction introduces alternative projects of relating to land and evading the rule of national sovereignty. Um, as you can see, his account um, uh, is quite um, uh, in line with what, in, with what I've been talking about, because he says speculation is not really a specific genre, but rather a mode of relation um, with the reader, um, a relation which um, which provides an opportunity to challenge the transparency of the real. And um, this function of speculative fiction uh, is therefore to raise questions about the ability of particular ways of knowing to grasp forms of being and becoming in the world. So uh, in this way, speculation not only poses the question what counts as real, but also invites to an engagement with not known. And uh, in this respect, speculative fiction reveals affinities, uh, as I think, with life performative interventions into the urban fabric, which employ fictional devices to steer the perception of the participants. And from my context, I would like to compare this novel with a performative project which was organized in Warsaw in 2006 on the 10th anniversary stadium, uh, Stadion Dziesięciolecia right before this uh, structure was dismantled. And uh, the place itself was quite significant because since the fall of the communism, it became a symbolic ruin of the communist society. As you can see, it opened in 1955 as part of the celebrations of the 10th anniversary of Poland, regaining the status of an independent state after the Second World War. And uh, for four decades, it served as a place for major sporting events. But since the mid 1980s, it was uh, gradually abandoned and finally fell into disrepair. But it was revived in 1989 and then rented to a private company that turned the stadium into the largest open air market in Europe. It was called Jarmark Europa. Uh, the place became a sort of a cultural melting pot because it drew not only Polish merchants, but also large groups of immigrants, uh, primarily from Russia and Vietnam, despite it being called Jarmark Europa. So this place of commercial and cultural exchange was finally closed in 2008, and in its place, the new national stadium was constructed, which um, ever since serves uh, for sporting and commercial cultural events. As you see, it's uh, white and red, if you didn't know it's Poland. And uh, it's also called national stadium. But the symbolic significance of this place has been even further highlighted, highlighted during the COVID pandemic, because it's also a place of what's called now national hospital, because at the moment, everything's national, even the lockdown in Poland is called national quarantine. So it's the largest uh, temporary uh, field hospital for COVID patients. So in a sense, this, um, this highly symbolic place um, was the place also of ousting of the cultural diversity by, by a national agen agenda, uh, which was visible also in the fabric of the city. And this uh, place provided a background for this project that um, I would like to mention, which was called Trip to Asia. And um, it was uh, an acoustic walk around the Vietnamese sector of the 10th anniversary stadium. Uh, this section uh, was actually called Little Hanoi or Little Vietnam. 
And it was conceived as a response to the symbolic absence of the Vietnamese population of Warsaw, which according to various estimates, um, which, um, uh, which, which are not really fully accounted for, um, this population ranges from 50 to 60,000 people um, who are centered mainly in the capital of Poland. So um, although every hundredth Varsovian was a Vietnamese, they uh, pretty much remained invisible in the fabric of the city. The same uh, can be said now about the Ukrainians um, who um, come to Poland after the, after the war, but still remain quite invisible as part of the society. And this project employed the format of a performative walk, which by that time was gaining popularity mainly due to the success of the German collective Rimini Protocol. And this trip began on the left bank of the Vistula, opposite National Museum, at a checkpoint where participants were given tickets, an MP3 player, if you remember the, this technology, and a map showing where they should play audio tracks. And also they were given something that you can see in the photograph on the right, namely uh, plastic bags, which are typically used uh, on the markets to transport large number of goods. And also 5,000 forged Vietnamese dongs, which could be used in designated stalls in exchange for goods, which also provoked interactions with sellers. So. Um, Clearly, um, the viewer um, was uh, um, somehow fictionalized, and this fictionalized frame imposed on him or her the vantage point that was alien to them. So they were, in a sense, supposed to become uh, Warsaw Vietnamese. And from the station, they traveled to the um, next one on the right bank of the river. And during the three minute trip, they were informed that they cross an imaginary border between Europe and Asia, listening to the same recorded message that uh, passengers hear when they land in Hanoi. And uh, listening to the audio and uh, guided by a map, they walked around the little Vietnam as the Vietnamese sector was called and learned about origins of Vietnamese migration to Poland the oppression of immigrants uh, and their experience in this land, the activities of uh, Vietnamese embassy and secret service, deportation, but also spectacular careers of uh, Vietnamese in Poland. And finally, they were taken to uh, Tang Long Vietnamese Cultural Center, which uh, um, was set up in that sector, together with a pagoda, which was built without any official permits, um, within a matter of days as a copy of One Pillar Buddha of Compassion Pagoda in Hanoi. And um, um, you can assume that this imposition of a fictional framework, in a sense, defamiliarize um, um, the perception um, of the participants who as citizens of Warsaw probably perceived this er um, er uh, area um, purely in commercial terms. And um, the trip was also a form of knowing with the urban landscape and revealed the existence of a city within a city, a vibrant culture which otherwise remained invisible and was soon to be obliterated. So in a sense, contrary to the novel, this trip to Asia offered an immersive experience in the fabric of the city and this experience intervened in the production of urban space against the demands of the capitalist empire but it's through enhancing the visibility of cultural others that uh, the project provided an opportunity of not only getting to know the other, but also engaging in a cultural exchange that was prevented in the course of daily affairs. But I think that there's a strong affinity between the novel and the project uh, in the sense they both uh, use the as if mode and introduce speculative fabulation as a means of decolonizing the social production of space. So in a way they pro provide forms of knowing with the city in order to explore other models of sociality away from the governing logic of nation state. And I think that from this point of view, they, they can be both treated as very powerful mechanisms of unlearning imperialism, a project which is closely connected with the colonial agenda. So uh, that's it as far as, um, our presentations are concerned, and um, I have noticed that we have some uh, questions. I think Eva is already, has already sent her um, slide to um, Douglas, but uh, are there any other 
questions or queries or feedback that we might get from you. We have a question from Katarzyna Murawska, um, who is also, um, which is also, I guess, connected with um, the topic of the presentations. I don't know if you would like to uh, ask this question, or should I read it? Well, I can, I can ask it. Thank you. Again. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very interesting, very interesting for me as a poll, you know, that was fa fascinating for, for me to listen to your to your presentations. And um, I, I mean, what I what I what I have written about Dear Hunter, it was just an association. So perhaps it's not really that that important, really, because I'm not because you were not even talking we're talking about the Wemkos, you know, so so that was just a kind of thing perhaps might have might help you or might not at all, you know, that, that's less important. But there is another thing which actually um, um, which I I found <laughs> uh, you had this fascinating titles. I mean, uh, your presentations were actually speaking to each other. You started in um, you began somehow in um, Poland looking into Far East, and then you ended in the same place as it were. And you had those titles that knowing was writing, knowing was stone, knowing was ruins, and knowing with the city. This is like poetry already. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the image. All of you were using um, images all the time. They snicked in somehow. Um, um, because you were using, and I do understand, I do the same, you were using as a kind of um, counterpoint or as a kind of strengthening of your argument or explaining to your viewer and listener what you want to say, you were using the covers of the books that you were talking about. And the majority of those covers had figurative images on them. Sometimes those covers were apropos, sometimes were completely different. You know, they were saying something, I mean, they talk their own languages is also very important. I'm actually very interested because I just submitted a manuscript of a book on imaging Eastern Europe. And the last chapter is about book covers, about the academic book covers, which actually took on this um, task of travel writers and maps, etc. Et so I just wonder, uh, was it a strategy? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess that images are less important for performance study for performance studies rather than writing and the city etc etc but I just I just want to I just want to hear from you uh, whether um, that was a strategy because you you were all using the covers of books and then you were using those images or um, did you want to say anything about it or it just happened I think it's a great point. Although it happened, <laughs> it just happened. But I think this I is uh, um, it's a it's a good point yeah. about, in a sense, the practices of uh, of visually attacking um, um, uh, the viewer. And I think it's also a way of engaging people during the presentation, which is uh, but, um, so difficult now that that we are distant. But um, but you're right. I think that. Uh, if we looked at our presentations again, we could probably read them for the way they employ imagery and um, and certain um, uh, covers to to carry out some to to, to carry, bring a point across, I guess. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. We have uh, a question from Nestor. I think the last one because we have five minutes. And the question is, since Baventura de Sousa Santos was mentioned, I wonder about the kinds of connections you made between the decolonial project in Latin America and what you are attempting to do. Does any one of my colleagues would like to try to answer? I will try, Laura. Oh. Yeah. Um, the question is uh, very pertinent to what we are doing, 
but um, uh, in the last book of uh, the Santos, so what is important is that he's do, uh, dealing with modernity, um, but modernities actually. So in a sense, what he's looking for is not so much alternatives to alternative modernities as to looking for alternative to modernities. And in the sense, uh, um, when we are looking at the global south and global north, we are um, uh, we are missing different um, part of the colonial project placed in within um, the um, uh, Western epistemy, but as a counter hegemonic project. So in a sense, what we are doing, we're trying to uh, use our vantage point of being pla placed in Poland and in Poland academia and being on the real border between East and West and uh, to look within Europe and European history and European literature, cultures and so on for some historical and current project of decoloniality. I don't know, maybe uh, somebody could uh, expand on, on this, what I said. Uh, I might, mom, I may only add to what Malgozata has said that in fact, what uh, we are trying to do is to show that the so-called abyssal line that uh, Sousa Santos has drawn between the global north and the global uh, uh, south is uh, in fact uh, much more meandric and capricious, let's say, that we might imagine. And in fact, uh, from my point of view, who uh, a person who is studying actually this minority language theater and performance, I can say that um, we have neglected probably in Europe the uh, disappearance of this local epistemis uh, of uh, ethnic minorities that has been uh, that have been in some way sacrificed during the process of national of creation of national states in Europe in the 19th century and the, in the 20th century. So it's it, it uh, what we are facing now. Maybe it's a possibility to retrieve those no no local knowledges in some way, which is obviously not a kind of reconstructing actually the ancient culture, but in some other way, as Lovenhout Singh uh, is saying, uh, by the or through the contaminated ethnicity. Uh, this is only a, 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 um, you know, a comment to what Malgozata has said, which I perfectly agree with. Thank you. Over to Carl, because we are 8 p.m. and uh, I think we we have exhausted you. Thank you very much. It's uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.